Well, today is our second week of When Pigs Fly, and we, didn't, we did something a little bit different today. You notice that when we started, usually in our prayer time, we'll pray over the needs for healing and everything, but this whole idea of When Pigs Fly is the impossible. We're talking about miracles. We're talking about those times. A miracle is something that only happens when God intervenes in the earth and in the lives of men and women and children. Miracles. How many of you have seen a miracle before? Everybody should raise their hand. Everybody should raise their hand. It's a miracle that you got out of bed this morning. It's a miracle that you were born. When you think about even the idea of what has to happen for you to come into existence, it's a miracle. I'm not going into the science of all of that. We live in a world of miracles. It's when God's divine power interacts with man. Last week, we talked about miracles of deliverance. Miracles of deliverance that out of Ephesians 6, when it says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities of this dark and evil world. And yes, I paraphrase that. But there is an enemy that tries to attack us, to oppress us, to keep us down. And we have authority over that. If you remember, we've had that, that authority I love that illustration of the police officer. You know, he couldn't stop a 18-wheeler with his hand, but he has the authority to stop that truck. And God's given us authority over this dark world. Over those evil spirits, we can say in Jesus' name, leave me alone and get out of here. We have authority. This week... Well, next week, I'll get to this week in just a second. Next week, we're going to talk about miracles of protection. And then the following week, we're going to finish this series up with miracles of provision. But this week, I want to talk to you about miracles of healing. Miracles of healing. This is one that, uh, and that's why we didn't pray over healing or over needs. Uh, earlier, we prayed over our community partners. But at the end of the service, we're going to pray for those things that need to be healed. And we're going to talk about this a little bit today. How many of you believe God can heal? It's going to be interactive today. How many of you believe God can heal? I believe God can heal. More than 30 times in the New Testament, we see Jesus heal. We see Him do many miracles. We see everything from leprosy being healed. We see the blind be able to see. We see the lame to be able to walk. Uh, man, all kinds of healings happen throughout Scripture. You see it all the way through the Old Testament as well. God heals. And Isaiah said, by His stripes we will be healed. We're going to talk about many different kinds of healing today. And if you remember, back a couple months ago, we did a series called Supernatural and kind of the verse that we use for that is, and I want to kind of bring it up again, is John 14, 12, where it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Jesus performed many miracles. He said, we're going to do the same. We're going to pray over people, and they're going to be healed. We're going to pray over things, and it's going to happen. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? The idea that we can pray and things would happen. I want to tell you kind of a funny story. Uh, it comes out of Acts chapter 20. We're going to use a lot of different scripture today. I'm not going to read all of them, but you can write them down and reference it. Acts chapter 20. How many of you guys have ever heard of a guy by the name of Paul, Apostle Paul? Anybody know who he is? Wrote most of the New Testament. Well, Paul was preaching one day. And there was a large crowd there. They were in a house. It was a three-story house and and he's preaching, and it says he got a little bit excited, a little bit long-winded, and he was preaching for hours and hours and hours, and, and it's going on into the night, and there was a young man, uh, I can't pronounce his name, I'm not even going to try to, this young man was sitting in the window, and he got a little bit sleepy, and he fell out of the window, and he died, and everybody got pretty upset, and Paul went down, and looked at this guy and said, oh no, my preaching killed this man. No, he, he went down and he prayed over him and he was brought back to life. 
That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, I've never killed anyone with my preaching. I have seen some people fall asleep. If you fall asleep, just, you know, kind of lean back in your chair. It'll be okay. That's a pretty crazy story. But God is faithful to heal. God always heals, and He uses us to be agents of that. Have you ever prayed for somebody and have them not be healed? I have. I've prayed for a lot of people that haven't been healed. That can be disappointing, isn't it? It can make us question our faith. It can make us doubt. We can be really shaken. We can, we can walk into services, and I've been in services where there has been evangelists and things, and people are being healed left and right, and I'll come in there and ask God to heal a specific circumstance or a specific situation, and you see all these people being healed, but yet, maybe not what I've prayed for. It makes you question. It makes you doubt. It makes you kind of wonder what's going on, or maybe there's been something going on in your life for a long time. Those things can shake us. Here's something I want you to understand today. If you don't get anything else out of today, I want you to understand this. It's going to be several little things. Our God heals. But He doesn't heal everyone all the time. Doesn't seem fair, does it? But it's something we've got to understand. Our God heals, but He doesn't heal everyone all the time. You can see throughout Scriptures there are times when God will heal somebody, but He'll walk by others. If you know the story of the pool of Bethesda, the lame man that was laying by the pool, and there was this this pool people would go to to be healed, and it said the angel would stir the water and the first person in would be healed. And so people, all these people that had all these illnesses and maybe they were blind, lame, whatever it was, would stand there by the pool. And then at a certain time, the angel would stir the pool and they would, the first one to get in would be healed. And there was a man there that was laying there that Jesus walked over to, had a conversation with him and prayed for him, and he was healed. Here's the thing about that. Was that the only man that was there? Now, if he's the only one that was there, he'd be the one that could get in the water when the angel stirred it. But it doesn't say that Jesus healed anyone else that was there. If they walked over to that one man, sometimes one person will be healed and another person won't. And we get confused. There are a couple things that I want to talk about with this. Even Paul... I just talked about Paul. Raised somebody from the dead after preaching and having the person fall in the window. Do you know there were times that Paul prayed and people weren't healed? There were times and instances that those that traveled with Paul, there was about eight people that traveled with Paul on a pretty consistent basis. And some of them were not healed. There's a guy by the name of Trophimus. He was with Paul on his third missionary journey. If you look at 2 Timothy 4.20, it's in your notes. It's a very small scripture that I'm going to read. But it says, Erasmus remained in Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, and Miletus. Now, if God healed every time, wouldn't have Paul just prayed for him and just took him along with him? You would think so. Look at Timothy. He's the next thing. Timothy apparently had some kind of stomach problem. In 1 Timothy 5.23, it says, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. There were things going on in Timothy's life that he was trying to overcome. Paul himself had a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that thorn in his flesh was. But we know in 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about it, that he prayed three times, that he pled, pled with the Lord to take it away. Scholars have kind of wondered what that maybe it was. Maybe it was bad eyesight. Maybe it was something other physically going on or, you know, maybe he just was bald. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it says it was his thorn in his flesh. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9 says this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pled with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
scholars have debated this for a long time. Some will tell you that Paul was not the greatest speaker. Actually, it says it in Scripture that he was more powerful with the pen than a dynamic speaker. He could write really well, but oftentimes he stumbled over whatever in his words. Sometimes we pray for healing. Do you know church people can be mean? Do you know that? Sometimes well-meaning Christians will say things, man, maybe you've been praying and you've been praying for a long time over something, and they'll come up to you and say, oh, well, you know, if you had better faith, you'd be healed. If you were living right for God, you'd be healed. If you were just this or that, then God would do what he's saying, like there's some formula to get God to do whatever we want God to do. And they're well-meaning sometimes, but it gets discouraged and it gets hard. It makes you want to just quit. You ever want to quit when people just kind of say things that just doesn't make sense or just hurts? I know I do. So what do you do when you have a God that you know can heal, but doesn't? How do you respond to that? How do you continue to pray for healing and grow in your faith when you pray and pray and pray and God doesn't seem to answer that prayer, the, and that's just it. Sometimes He doesn't answer the prayer we want, the way we want Him to. But how do you continue to grow your faith when you keep praying for healing and that healing doesn't come? I want to look at three reasons that Jesus didn't perform miracles. Three reasons, and we're going to go into this a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit deeper about this, but there's three main reasons that Jesus didn't perform miracles. And the first one is this. Jesus refused to perform miracles to prove himself. To prove himself. Now, I think this may hit a little close to home for some people. How many of you have ever tried to bargain with God? You ever think about that? God, if you will just do this, then I will serve you the rest of my life. You ever, heard, you ever do that? I mean, I've heard people do that. I've done it. Man, God, if you will just let that pretty girl kiss me, I will serve you forever. That was my 10-year-old prayer. Maybe it was my 18-year-old prayer. I don't know what it was. But if you, you know, if you get to that place and you just bargain with God, God, if you just get me out of this situation, I promise I will serve you forever. That bargaining with God, that, that getting God to do things and trying to get Him to prove Himself to you, if God would just do this. God, if you were real, then you do this. You turn that stone into a piece of bread. God, if you're real, do this for me right now. So that's what the Pharisees tried to do to Him in Mark chapter 8. Verses 11 and 12 are in your, in your uh, notes. But the Pharisees tried to get Jesus to prove Himself. Their motives were to discredit Him. But look what Jesus said to him. It says, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test Him. They asked Him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. I love the image that's there. Jesus is frustrated. He knows their hearts. He knows what they're trying to do. It says that he sighed. It's like, oh, come on. Really? All of it's been laid out before you and who I am. Really, you want me to give you a sign? You want me to perform tricks for you? Just give me a sign, God. They treated God like a parlor act. They treated Jesus, hey, let's just do some tricks for me, Jesus. Show me that you are who you say you are. Jesus never did anything to prove himself. He never performed miracles to prove himself. So the second thing is, Jesus never performed miracles that interfered with God's ultimate plan. That interfered with God's ultimate plan. How many of you know exactly what God's purpose is in every situation? Anybody? 
No, none of us do. We can't see that big picture. God sees the whole of time in one shot. We see only fractions and pieces of time. And then we don't even see it that clearly. We think we do. We think we have it right. And God gives us pieces through the Holy Spirit, but we don't see all of time. Just like with Paul and that thorn in his flesh, God gave him wisdom to say, look, this is to keep you kind of humbled. This is to keep you from getting too proud in who you are. So he praised him in his weakness. God's ultimate purpose trumps our desire for a miracle. Think about that for a second. God's ultimate purpose trumps our desire for a miracle. You know, Scripture tells us that He'll work all things out for the good of those that love Him. We have to trust that God, if He says no on a miracle today, if He says no on a healing today, that there's a purpose for that. We wrestle. We struggle. We hurt. We don't always understand and we get confused. There are times when, uh, when Jesus does one miracle, but then not another miracle. And here's kind of a dichotomy for you. Some of you remember when Jesus, just before He went to the cross, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, you know the different Gospels show a little different side of the story. But in one of them, when Judas comes and the, and the high priest comes to arrest Jesus, what does Peter do? Anybody know? Takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of the chief priest man there. He just takes him out, cuts off his ear. And Jesus kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And that's what we see in Matthew 26, verse 52. It says, And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. I'm going to read the rest of that in just a second. Then Jesus, the, another version says that Jesus took that ear, they got the ear, and he healed the man that was there. Now he performed a miracle of healing. But then he didn't perform a miracle that could have protected his life. Because if you read that next verse there, in verse 53, it says, Don't you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And He will come and send more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled so that it must be so? See, Jesus could have called down all the legions of heaven to protect Him and to keep the enemy from Him, but He knew what needed to be done on the cross for us and for all of mankind. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. He could have avoided it, but He did it out of love and compassion for us. Just the same way the guy that came to arrest Him, He healed His ear. See, God sees the bigger picture. God knows what we need. So we have to trust Him in that. Jesus never performed miracles that would get in the way of God's plans and what God was trying to do. His overall goal for us. He knew the bigger picture. The third one is Jesus didn't perform miracles where there was no faith. Where there was no faith. If you look at, um, look at the Scripture when Jesus was going through, and it's in Matthew 13, when He was going back through His hometown. 13.58 says, And He did not do many miracles there because of the lack of faith. People, didn't know, people knew who Jesus was in His hometown. They're like, isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't that the carpenter's boy? He can't do miracles. We know who He is. What's He all high and mighty about? We don't trust Him. He's just that kid, from that carpenter's kid. He wasn't able to perform miracles in His hometown because of their lack of faith. See, faith moves the heart of God. Faith 
touches the heart of God. Your faith touches the heart of God. The enemy wants to tear our faith down. That's why we struggle so much in so many different areas. He'll whisper things in our ear. Well, God must not love you because He doesn't heal you. He'll whisper those things in. He'll use people in the church to speak things like, hey, if you had more faith and you know all these other things. But see, faith moves the heart of God. Let me give you some examples of God's of extreme faith moving the heart of God. In Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, there's this lady who had been bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. And if you, when you read that passage, and you read that Scripture, it said that she exhausted everything she had on doctors and every possible remedy that there was out there to try and fix what was going on. And if you knew the Jewish culture... That meant that she was unclean. That meant that she couldn't go into the temple. That meant that her life was isolation. She heard about Jesus. And she said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of His garment, I could be healed. And so she pushes her way through the crowd and she grabs a hold of Jesus' robe and she's instantly healed. And Jesus knew the power had gone out of him. He knew that something had happened. Of course, he knew what was going on. He said, wait, who's touching me? And his disciples are like, dude, we're in a big crowd. There's a lot of people touching you. He said, no, who touched me? The power left me. That lady weeping said it was me. If you look at verse 34, it says, daughter... Your faith has healed you. Jesus didn't even have to do anything. But her faith in the, that, that He could heal her, her faith was so strong that if she just touched the garment, she was healed. In Luke 17, there were ten lepers. They were crying out to Jesus they went by. And if you know, leprosy is a terrible disease. It was a skin disease actually deteriorate cartilage. And man, it was just nasty. Nasty disease. And, and it was contagious, and so lepers would have to be pushed to the side and, and isolated, and these lepers were calling out to Jesus, and there were ten of them, and Jesus looks over to them and says, hey, go to, the, go to the chief priest so that you can show that you're cleansed, you are healed, and they ran, but one came back to Jesus. And this is where I want you to see it in Luke seventeen nineteen. The one leper came back and praised God. And actually, Jesus said, where are the other nine? And he says this, rise and go, because he fell on his knees before Jesus. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Then you have blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10. He gets the attention of Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want, to do, want me to do for you? And he says, I want, I want to see again. I want to, I want to see. In Mark 10, 52, Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. So we see that Jesus doesn't perform miracles on demand. To prove himself. We see that he doesn't perform miracles when there's a bigger picture and a bigger plan in play. And we see that he can't perform miracles where there's no faith at all. There's so many stories of extreme faith. How many of you guys have ever heard the story of the Roman centurion? Man, it's one of my favorite stories. This Roman centurion. Roman soldier comes up to Jesus. And he says, look, man, one of my servants is sick. I don't want you to come into my house. I don't need you to come into my house. He goes, man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person of authority. I understand authority. If I tell somebody to go and do something, they go and do it. I know that you can heal without coming there. That You have great authority. And Jesus chose to heal the servant 
of the Roman centurion, and then he said something pretty cool. He said nowhere, he was amazed at this man's faith. He said there's no greater faith in all of Israel than that Roman centurion. Somebody that didn't, he wasn't a Jew, he wasn't somebody that followed God. He, but he saw what Jesus could do. He saw the miracles that Jesus performed. And he said, look, all you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. You don't have to come into my house. My house is not worthy for you. That's crazy faith. Trusting God in that way. Just as Jesus is amazed in the faith of the centurion, he's equally disappointed when people have such a lack of faith. There's how many times did he say in Scripture where he was just disappointed? You faithless people. Why do you lack such faith? Here's the thing. I want to encourage you. Maybe you don't have a lot of faith. Some people have a greater measure of faith. It's one of the spiritual gifts. But it also says that a mustard seed of faith will move mountains. You may not have to have a huge amount of faith, but you can have a small amount of faith and have faith with what you have. You guys remember last week we talked about the young man that, um, well, the father that had the son that was having convulsions. He was possessed by an evil spirit. And the, the, the evil spirit would try to throw him in water and try to throw him in fire and try to kill him. When Jesus was talking to the father in Mark 9, he talks about this. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I believe that you can do it, God, but help me where I lack faith. Help me in my unbelief. That's a legitimate prayer to God. God knows our heart. He knows where we struggle. He knows when we struggle to believe that those things are going to happen. Whether it's for healing, whether it's in our finances, no matter what it is, that we, if we struggle with that faith, if our faith is just small, maybe it's just the size of a mustard seed, but we can ask God, Lord, help me where I can't believe or where I need more strength in believing. Help me, God. I've prayed that prayer many times. I've struggled with doubt. You say, well, you're a pastor. How can you struggle with doubt? Man, we all struggle with doubt. And every time I go to pray for somebody, especially wearing the title of pastor, it's not something that I, that I take for granted. But you come up and you preach a message on healing, and man, you want to go up and pray for everybody, and you want everybody to be healed because you want God to show up and, and to show and heal everybody. But we know that there are going to be times when we've prayed for people and they're not going to be healed. At least not now. Sure, I doubt at times. But I've also seen God do some crazy, crazy things. Things that are just unbelievable. Broken bones healed. Now, I didn't know Jennifer back when she was young, but she had epilepsy when she was younger, and God healed her of epilepsy. God has healed a lot of people. See, and there's one other thing. This is probably the most important statement I'll make today. Our faith is not based on what God does. Our faith is based on who God is. Let that sink in for a minute. Our faith is not based on what God does. Our faith is based on who God is. So we've got to keep that in the right perspective. There are times that we're going to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and the answer is going to be no. No.
Does that change who God is? If our, fra- if our faith rests on what God does, the minute God does something different than what we think He should do, our faith is going to crumble. performance-based. I'm thankful for a God that isn't fully performance-based because my salvation is assured through the blood of Jesus Christ because I've come to Him, not because I've lived a perfect life. And we can't base our faith in God on what He does. We can base it on what He has done and who He is. Because He died on the cross for us. Because He loved us that much. Our faith is because He is the great Creator. Our faith is in who He is, not what He does. See, Jesus' ultimate purpose was not to heal our bodies. It was to save our souls. Now, yes, this is true. When we leave this earth, when we get to heaven, when we get our new bodies, we are going to be perfectly healed. Jesus will heal everyone. 100%. But sometimes we get hung up when God doesn't do what we want Him to do. Because he didn't perform the way we wanted him to perform. We have to keep things in mind that Jesus doesn't just perform miracles on demand, that he's not, you know, he does things according to the will of the Father. That's really the ultimate. His bigger purpose is to see lives changed and touched. Sometimes that healing might lead to a destructive path for us. Sometimes He waits to show that healing for just the right moment because others might come to Christ. Sometimes He uses different points in our lives to draw others to Him. We have to trust Him. We have to believe that He's going to do what's right in all circumstances. Does that mean that we shouldn't pray? Absolutely not. Our faith moves the heart of God We should pray. We should seek. We should knock with whatever faith we have. If it's the size of a mustard seed, if it's the size of a river, whatever that faith is, we should continue to knock. It's a funny story. And we'll wrap up in just a second. A funny story in Scripture. There was a paralyzed guy and he had some friends that knew that Jesus was in town and said, if we just get him there. And they get to the house where Jesus was and you may know the story. It was pretty full. It was pretty packed. So what do they do? They get the idea. They'll go climb up on the roof. And they rip a hole in the roof. They're like, if we just chuck him down there, Jesus will heal him. Well, that's not exactly what they said. They lowered him down, but I just was kind of paraphrasing a little bit. And they lowered him down to Jesus. There's two things that Jesus did. The first one is the part that I wanted to mention. First thing he did was forgive him of his sins. Then he told him to get up and walk. Jesus' number one priority is our salvation in relationship with Him. It's not our healing. But God does desire to heal. It's not just limited to physical healing. It could be emotional healing. It could be spiritual healing. You know, we need to be healed in a lot of ways. Some of us are broken emotionally. Some of us are broken spiritually. That's God's number one concern. 
He wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. Some of us are broken physically. God wants to touch you this morning. So I want to have, as Pastor Jennifer comes up, I want to have a time of prayer. And I want to pray for healing today. And I believe that God wants to show up and show off and, and kind of do some really big things in your life today. And we do have some physical needs today. We've been praying for quite a while for Mary. We're going to continue to pray. And we're going to pray and pray and pray and not stop praying. If you have a need for a physical touch today, let's pray over it. If you have need for an emotional touch today, let's pray over it. God desires to heal. If you know somebody that's hurting, you want to just go put a hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Pray for them. Maybe you're doing okay physically. Maybe things are all right with you. And you don't need that healing, but you know somebody that does. Lift their name up to God this morning. I feel like most of us, we have a little bit of both and. There's some things in our lives that need to be healed. But there's also some people in our lives that need to be healed as well. lift those needs up to God. If somebody's laid on your heart, just go pray for them. Just be respectful. We're going to spend a few minutes in prayer this morning. Allow God to touch us and heal us.